iSelect Fund is not soliciting investment or providing investment advice in any way whatsoever. This presentation is general industry research based on publicly available information. iSelect is an early stage venture capital firm in St. Louis focused on early stage companies in food, agriculture, and health. iSelect invests at the forefront of innovation, seeking emerging problems, solutions, and technologies. iSelect uses these deep dive presentations not only as a way to better engage with and understand new science and technology, but also engage with the experts and entrepreneurs who drive and change innovation in their respective fields. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to iSelect Fund's Deep Dive webinar series. My name is Tom Bunn, a principal on the iSelect Fund Ventures team, and I'm excited to walk you through today's discussion. For those new to these webinars, iSelect is a venture capital firm in St. Louis focused on early stage companies in food, agriculture, and health. iSelect invests at the forefront of innovation, seeing emerging problems, solutions, and technologies at their infancy. We use these deep dive discussions not only as a way for us to better engage with and understand new science and technology, but more, important, more importantly, to engage with the experts and entrepreneurs who are driving change and innovation in their respective fields. One theme that we've been researching is precision fermentation. Fermentation, as you all know, has been used in food production for centuries. You can thank it for beer, wine, kimchi, yogurt, and much more but precision fermentation technology is taking this metabolic process to new heights by applying biological engineering, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and more to program microbes to make specific customized molecules in food, pharmaceuticals, materials, fuels, and more. The result is bioidentical or novel molecules and compounds that use far less water, land, and energy to produce. As the costs associated with precision fermentation continue to fall, these basic building blocks are finding new applications across the food system in a wide range of other products. For these reasons and many others, which we will cover in today's webinar, precision fermentation is of increasing interest to iSelect. And just by way of background or by way of table of contents, we'll do brief speaker introductions. I'll give a very brief framework backbone of uh, what precision fermentation is to, to set the stage. And then we'll get right into the expert discussions, uh, expert discussion, and then into uh, probably a broader conversation and Q and A. We should have 10 to 20 minutes at the end for broader questions and answers. So feel free to uh, start, start pouring in your questions as, as soon as you uh, think of them. So a big thank you to our guests. We have a great crew with us this morning, uh, this afternoon. I know Alex is in Switzerland, um, but Dr. Doug Cameron, do you mind giving a, uh, a quick background introduction on yourself? Sure, so thanks Thomas for inviting me to this. It's, it's great to participate. Um, I, I'm currently an advisor and board member to a number of companies in this space and in the agricultural space, but I got my start in this quite a long time ago. In fact, my first job directly out of college, out of undergrad was with a startup company focused on large scale protein production. So I've been thinking about this since literally about a week after getting out of college. Um, after working for that startup company for several years, I realized I needed to go to grad school to learn more, went to MIT, studied biochemical engineering there, and, and ended up um, becoming a professor of chemical engineering at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where I decided I wanted to de help develop this emerging field at the time called metabolic engineering, which is really one of the predecessors of precision biology or precision fermentation. I had the opportunity to work on one of the first true industrial metabolic engineering processes at the time. I worked with DuPont on helping to develop the process for the production of 1,3-propanediol, which is still a viable product today and one of the first examples of what we now would call precision fermentation. Um, Love the academic world, but ended up um, deciding to join Cargill, where I started the corporate biotech group at Cargill and was chief scientist there and was, was responsible for a wide range of different, what would again be called precision fermentation projects at the time. In 2006, I moved into the venture capital and investing world, and I've been doing that ever since. A couple companies that I was involved in invest, investing in that you may know of, um, Jivo, um, another one that's still out there is called Lanzatech. And, um, <clears throat> um, 
and, and moved into a number of different venture roles. Um, the most recent investment that I was involved in was while I was working with a Chinese-based private equity firm, invested in a company called Moja, which makes vitamin B5 and other chemicals in China. So that's kind of a high level overview of, of what I'm currently doing. Great, thanks Doug. Excited to dive into um, your, your eye on this technology uh, momentarily. Dr. Alex Batiste, do you mind giving a brief introduction on yourself, please? Yeah, thanks uh, Tom for, uh, for inviting me. Um, Alex Batiste, originally from the Netherlands, if you hear an accent, you don't need to guess. I uh, did my BS and MS in Chemi, came to the States for a PhD. Uh, at the University of Florida, also a chemi, then joined Cargill, where I met Doug and uh, basically took Doug's ideas to scale. So my job was take uh, take high fermentation to um, two tons of us, as we uh, used to call it. Um, after lactic acid, citric acid, uh, and then uh, several high potency sweeteners as well. Then uh, went to Genomatica, uh, joined uh, the, the world of startup and, um, and uh, worked on developing and scaling the 1,4 butane dial process that's been much talked about all the way to, uh, to Novomont in Italy. It's still running. Then uh, after uh, uh, Genomatica went to Bolt Threads, spider silk uh, without a spider and leather without a cow, developed a supply chain, developed the process and the supply chains for both, uh, both products. And then for the last two years, I'm, uh, I've been COO at Geltor doing the same thing basically taking uh, taking uh, collagen or designer proteins from the lab to uh, to tons of us fantastic thanks for joining us this morning alex and finally mark warner mark do you mind giving a brief background please sure thanks thomas and uh, appreciate the uh opportunity just like the other two mark warner um currently ceo of liberation labs i started my career as a chemical engineer worked up through plant operations with Monsanto and some other chemical companies, worked at some big engineering firms, and in the early 2000s, took the jump into an early stage uh, biofuels company as one of the, the first employees raised 120 million of equity and kind of got the bug for scaling first of kind biotechnology. Like Alex, I'm used to scaling it, but I'm more used to being the design build side of it. So the the capacity build out um, that led me eventually after working at some engineering firms and some biofuels company. I've been in-house twice. I was with the uh, with Solazyme as their senior vice president of engineering, uh, led the design build startup of their 3.3 million liter facility in Brazil and dealt with their partnership with ADM. Left there to join Impossible Foods in the early days of scale up as their chief engineering officer became clear to me about seven years ago that most people in the space weren't building anything at that point. In fact, they're just talking about it now. So I started my own consulting function, Warner Advisors LLC, and did that for about seven years. Worked for about a hundred different companies in the space, primarily making novel proteins, and have published a lot on kind of the need for fermentation capacity and, and what's out there today, not really fitting what's needed. So recently made the jumps to Liberation Labs that's focused on bringing on some large scale fermentation capacity. So thanks, Thomas. Fantastic. Well, I'll set the stage just a little bit. So as we all know, fermentation is the process by which microorganisms break down sugars into useful components. So in the traditional fermentation process, live microorganisms are used to change foods, flavor, texture, or nutritional content. In contrast, precision fermentation uses microbial hosts as cell factories for producing specific functional ingredients. These can be enzymes, flavoring agents, vitamins, natural pigments, or fats. Once a specific target is selected, such as Impossible Foods heme protein or vitamin B2 to products uh, that are produced via precision fermentation, strain engineering is used to direct the microbe to make the specific molecule or compound. In the case of a protein target, the instruction manual for synthesizing that protein is encoded in that host organism's DNA, either as a naturally occurring gene or as a gene introduced through engineering. Then comes the question of feedstock or what to feed the microbe to optimally produce the target. Feedstocks are one of the major cost drivers for most fermentation processes and feedstock optimization is 
key to ensure economic viability and, and also sustainability. Finally, in order to do this at large volumes, the process must scale from the pilot scale of tens of liters to thousands or hundreds of thousands of liters at the commercial scale. So with this basic framework in mind, uh, let's get into some perspectives from the experts on what it takes to bring a target product from idea to commercialization using uh, or through the frame, through the lens of strain development, feedstock optimization, uh, capacity uh, and target selection. Um, and we're gonna start with, with Doug. Um, Doug, you're a veteran in the space. W what have been some of the most significant technological developments in precision fermentation uh, that you've seen in your career? So I'll divide my comments <clears throat> into two sections. First of all, talk a little bit about product and then about technology. And I, I would also say, you know, this term precision fermentation is a fairly new term. I actually like it. Um, it is sort of replacing, at least in some applications, the older term uh, synthetic biology, which, you know, is great for scientists, not great, not so great for commercial or for marketing or for um, customers. So on the product side, <clears throat> I just have to start by highlighting one of the things that was done by Cargill in the early 2000s, which I think is, is a tour de force of the, the synthetic biology precision fermentation. And that's the development of a yeast-based lactic acid process. Um, very, you know, not very widely known, but around that time frame. Cargill, a developer of polylactic acid, was looking for a more efficient way to make lactic acid. And the, one of the oldest fermentation processes in the world is, is the bacterial-based lactic acid process. And Cargill rather audaciously decided to, to isolate a brand new yeast, develop all of the tools, and engineer lactic acid production into a yeast, and ultimately replaced a large scale commercial process based on the old technology with the yeast technology. The reason was because they wanted to operate at very low pHs to facilitate product recovery. So not well known, but uh, uh, really a tour de force. Lately, I think the, the products that are probably the most interesting to me is the explosion in, in all types of proteins for foods, for cosmetics, or um, other applications outside of pharma. That is just an explosive area and many of you could probably name five or 10 companies that do that. An emerging area that is also, I think, starting to grow very rapidly is, is um, lipids. So clearly Solozyme did this, but there's now a resurgence of lipids in yeast and probably four or five companies doing that. Again, many of those are precision biology projects. And um, so I would say those are some of the, the more exciting things that are happening in the product space. In the technology space, i just um, highlight a few things. Um, it's been stated several times, but it, it bears repeating is that DNA technology is advancing faster than Moore's law. The sequencing of DNA, the so the reading of DNA, the writing of DNA, and the editing of DNA is just ex explosive growth. And I expect that that will continue to happen for several, uh, several more years. So that's one of the huge opportunities and advances in this space. Um, another just massive advance is the solving of the protein folding problem. Many of you have heard of, of um, AlphaFold. Um, developed by Google X. Rosetta Fold is a related one. This will have revolutionary effects starting to today and will continue to have revolutionary implications. Um, uh, I'm on the board of a company called DMC, which has developed technology to decouple growth from product formation. And this was kind of a holy grail problem when I was in grad school. And I continue to expect advances in that space. Um, just a couple more points. You know, massive, massive opportunity are um, companies that have done high throughput work. And I think that's important, but I just want to reemphasize that 
what I would call custom or bespoke strain design, I think will continue to be highly significant. So these high throughput tools will make it easier and easier, but designing a microorganism for a fermentation process is more akin to designing a Ferrari than a, than a Ford. I, you, know, you, you only have to do it once and then you can use this thing over and over again. So you don't really need you know, large assembly lines to build the organisms. You need really artisanal, smart, bespoke engineering, which makes use of all of these tools that are available. And then just one more area that I think is significant. There is a limited number of people who really understand how to do fermentation process development, um, optimization of media, you know, going through all of that. It's a labor intensive and those types of people are in short supply. So companies like Culture Bio that are trying to make that, you know, more widely accessible are important. Um, those are a few initial thoughts. Happy to discuss any of them later in the discussion section. Sure. Yeah, I was going to ask about strain design and engineering, and I think you you covered that. Um, you covered that. What, what I like, like I like the Ferrari approach myself, but I yeah. you know, make use of all the great tools, but use the Ferrari approach as opposed to the assembly line approach. I love it. Um, can you talk about the importance of feedstock? So, what are you what are you feeding these bugs, uh, these microbes? Um, how is that changing? Oh, I know no. I know there's some. Let me let me jump into one one more thing that I think sure. you were you were going to ask me about before I jump into feedstocks, and that is you know what what are some of the the challenges in this field, because right now you know we can make these organisms, but I think the biggest challenge remains product selection, and actually deciding what you're going to make. You can now make things very fast, and it's pretty easy to come up with an idea and make them. You know, back when I did 1,3-propanediol, it wasn't even clear whether we'd be able to get the genes. You know, that was a big, big question mark in the process. Now finding the genes is, is almost a, a trivial part of this, but product selection continues to be very important. What do you make with all of these tools? Um, part of it is, I guess, let me quote um, Hans Van Dyken, who is one of the leaders in this field. He says, the most important type of omics is not genomics or metabolomics or proteomics, but economics, economics. And so, you know, finding what the, the products are is very, very critical. Um, regulatory hurdles are a big barrier, particularly if you're going into food related products in figuring out how to deal with these regulatory barriers. And so looking for manufacturing and strain development techniques that get around you know, the, the most extreme forms of genetic engineering. So you know, how do you use non-GMO methods to improve strains? And that is a big part of precision fermentation. Um, I think technologies like laboratory evolution, um, there's a company in Denmark called Trade Omics that focuses on trying to modify strains without using techniques that will trigger the European regulatory agencies. And then final comment, or, or two real quick comments, downstream processing remains a big, big challenge for everybody. And then as Mark and Alex will discuss, contract manufacturing or large-scale manufacturing is a big issue. So, you know, I know I jumped in there, um, but I'll, 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 I'll address your feedstock question because you introduced the topic as precision fermentation is sugars to chemicals and sugars are by far the most common feedstock. I think that as, as we go on, land use issues and sustainability issues will cause two changes to occur. There'll be more and more interest in using what I call second generation sugars. These are biomass derived sugars. I think will continue to become more and more important in this field. So companies like uh, Gran Bio in Brazil and there's several others that are trying to develop sugars that 
don't compete directly with food will be one trend. And then I'm a huge fan of methanol as a feedstock of the future. There are multiple sustainable ways to make methanol. So it's a liquid, it's not as hard to ferment as a gas, and it's transportable. And there are all sorts of pressures that are pushing industry towards developing better and better and more sustainable forms of methanol. I think, you know, if we're talking about C1s, I think formic acid is also interesting. Similar story to methanol and then acetic acid and ethanol. So if I was gonna predict the feedstocks of the future, it's gonna be second generation sugars, it's gonna be C1s like formic and methanol and C2s like acetic acid and ethanol. So. Fantastic, appreciate yep. that. Um, we'll come back to, to some of those questions, Doug, I'm sure at the end, but um, yep. moving on to, to Mark Warner. Um, Mark, can you walk us through how you see the problem of, of capacity in this space? You know, I, I see it a couple fold. Um, first, I mean, there is just a capacity shortage and we'll, we'll talk about the details of that, but there, you know, the vast majority of the, the contract fermentation today are 40 years old or older. Most was built predominantly in Europe to make pharmaceuticals and especially I, I'll note up front while I work on all these different matrices in recent years, um, precision protein fermentation has really been my focus. And especially when you, you get into the food proteins, none of the facilities that are out there running today were built to do it. They were built for something else. They were repurposed as best they can. As I like to say, these facilities are doing amazing work, but it's what happens when you retask a facility. Usually the fermentation is pretty good. And the one comment I'll make, and I agree with, with everything Doug said, I think we made a lot of progress, but when you look at a lot of the legacy industries, the lactic acid, the citric acids, those don't have the same profile of fermenter need as the food proteins typically do. So that's why things have migrated to these former pharma facilities, because they had the agitated high oxygen transfer type fermenters that were needed. The problem is most of them are 60, 70 years old. So with that, there's a capacity issue, but there's also a similar cost issue in that we're using the, these facilities that weren't built of a size, they weren't built in the geography to make things at the price point for food, because we don't like to pay a lot for food. So those, those are go hand in hand. It's not just the capacity that's out there, but what's out there, people are making these products, but they're making them at price points significantly higher than they want to be making a map. So I agree completely. I use almost word for word the same comment Doug does. It's it's an economics problem as much as a science problem. So I would never say that the technology is completely um, resolved, but I think it's more we can make the things we want, just not at the price points we want. And then just to touch on the other issue about the downstream, you'll probably hear a lot about the fermentation generally exists to do, and this is a, a slide from a Good Food Institute presentation I did about a year ago on kind of the contract fermentation markets. And this, um, I think at the time I published this, I think Alex told me that was that was a pretty good view of what's happening to all these startups trying to squeeze in to the same asset. So, you know, there, there's people trying to, to build out that larger scale capacity and if you go to the next slide, you'll see really kind of the summary. This is a view I had on the market um, through my consulting practice um, before I moved into Liberation Labs. And it's, I benchmarked the total CMO market out there today at about 61 million liters of total capacity worldwide. In any given year, about 10 million of that goes in and out of contract. Only a couple million or less was really built to do food. Um, the problem is, so this slide's about a year old from a Good Food Institute presentation. As I said at that point, within 12 to 24 months, I projected that we were going to basically be out of food fermentation capacity. I believe we're there now. Now, I need to put the caveat, you can find fermentation capacity. It's one that has a downstream that can then convert it into a food protein. It's 
as I like to talk about the food protein downstream, it's different than we're often used to with APIs and other things. It's basically a high tech version of sorting rocks. If you think of sorting rocks, you have boulders, mid-sized rocks and small rocks. You're basically, once you ferment the protein, assuming it's a secreted protein with the organism, you're looking for the middle sized rock. You wanna take out the big rocks, which are the, um, the organism, and you need to get rid of the small rocks, which are the media and other components, which sounds um, pretty straightforward. But as Doug said, you'll look at these proteins and you'll get these kill adult and sizes and things, but a lot of it on how it reacts depends on how it folds and in what form it's in. So this is technologies that have come generally out of pharma, microfiltration, ultrafiltration, centrifugation, that have become much more cost effective in recent years. So you see them used in the milk industry, you see them used in other food industries um, a fair amount, but it's getting those to the scale and cost we need to match with the existing fermentation technology to bring these um, technologies to commercial viability. Great. And so you mentioned the capacity is 40 to 60, year old, 60 years old and that downstream processing, I, I believe is the kind of the crux yep. of that problem. Um, so can you, can you retrofit these or what are the biggest gaps in the existing infrastructure that could, could it be added on or does it need to start anew? Yeah, well, it, it doesn't have to be added on, but the question is twofold. So majority of the clients I had were going to fermenters in Europe that were 50, 60 years old. Um, again, they're, they're able to make the products, but they often aren't able to make them. So when I build a facility, I worry about how many batches per year do I get? How do I minimize the cycle time, the sterility time? How do I make sure that I'm located in a place that has low sugar costs. Because again, at smaller scale, there's one cost structure. When I get to very large scale, um, sugar, labor, and um, um, electrical power are gonna be 70 to 75% of the cost of the operating the facility. Where most of these facilities are built today is where it made sense for a pharma facility. It's not necessarily where you would put, I mean, Biggest gap we have today is in the US, especially in the Midwest. Where would you normally put a lot of these facilities? Brazil, you would put it in the US Midwest. Where's a lot of the capacity today? It's in Europe and other places, which again, they're doing amazing work. They just don't have the cost structure of what you'd normally build to make food. So that's why you're gonna keep reiter hear us reiterating the cost issue. It's not that they can make them, it's that there's a structural cost disadvantage that keeps a lot of these products from reaching economic viability. Got it. Great. I guess just back to back to Doug on the feedstock side. Some of the alternative feedstocks you mentioned. Um, how do those compare in, in in cost? I think the trend is that the 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 trend is that the cost will go down over time. So you know, you know it's. It, Methanol, for example, is a commodity. It's got a kind of a complex cost structure at this point, but all of the all of the vectors are moving towards this will become cheaper and more abundant over time. Great. And again, and if, if I could add on to that, I meant to comment on that when Doug said it. It's and we didn't practice this. I I am a big believer in methanol too, and it's it's more it, it's an issue with these older facilities. The most common food protein organism today is a methanol fed picia. Now, what Doug's talking about is using it as a primary raw material. In this case, it's just using an induction agent, but still a lot of these older facilities have a real hard time using it. And often the CMO market is trying to talk people out of using methanol because it's hard for them to use. Like Doug, I've just generally found those strains to be the most productive and the closest to economic viability. So like Doug, I believe strongly that methanol is a significant feedstock. The only one I might add to his list, I've seen a lot of glycerin byproducts that also can be, um, be beneficial. I don't think they have the scale that methanol and other things do, which is I'm sure why Doug's bringing them up. But I, I see glycerin also tuck in there as a valuable feedstock. Great. 
Can I add um, one comment to that, uh, Tom? Please, uh, yeah. Because I, I, I like the second gen uh, feedstock discussion. Uh, but uh, uh, Chris Gusky, who uh, most of you will know, he made a good comment. He said, you know, when you go second, uh, second gen or glycerol uh, waste streams, somebody's got to pay for, for takes. And my experience is that, um, that you end up paying, right? You get a cheaper feedstock, but you end up paying taking out, taking out the trash. So what you see today is these feedstocks, like even molasses, right? God knows how many folks have asked us to run molasses if we can run molasses. But it only works for ethanol because it's easy to strip off. And uh, yeah. so. and I and I, I'm not. I mean, certainly you want to look at some of these lower cost feedstocks. I'm not a huge fan of like the waste feedstocks like glycerol or others, just because they're the, the limited availability of them. I'm I'm and I'm I also am a longer term venture investor, so I'm looking at what's what's the future going to be. And that's where I see things like methanol being the future. Clearly, they're not completely here today. There is a great intriguing paper, I should say, published in PNAS that talks about the electrochemical approach to agriculture, uh, which also talks about methanol. So this is more of a long term thing, but I, I see it emerging. Great. I do want to get back to, to, to Mark and Liberation Labs. Um, Mark, can you talk about the vision for Liberation Labs and um, what the ideal time for Liberation Labs to engage with the company is, kind of what the economic proof points or otherwise it, that, that you look for or that you will look for? Sure. I mean, quite simply, what we're looking to do is bring a purpose-built solution that we don't believe exists today, which is a facility designed and built to host novel proteins. So predominantly secreted food proteins, which I would argue, I think we have a list of 20, 25 companies we believe could be hosted by this. And it's, it's, um, it's not just that we can host it, but we can host it in a purpose-built cost structure to make the food proteins. And I will tell you, I think most of the fermentation generally exists today. If you're building a newer lysine type facility, people are building fermenters closer to the sterility profile and things that are required. I'm not saying we don't bring some innovation, but I think a lot of it is the downstream. Because again, uh, you're, you're hearing this theme that the downstream is often pieced together with what the CMO has existing, not purpose built in size and scale. And the things I often see are, for example, coming out of pharma, you'll often see when you, once you ferment, one question is how much wash addition water do I need as I go through these filtration steps? I'll often see companies tell me they're gonna use five, 10 times the, the amount of broth in wash water because you can do that in pharma at very small scale. When you're, when you're running at very large scale, that's millions and millions of gallons a day. So those aren't options. That's not what the food industry does. So we're, we're looking more on the downstream to the way the food industry does it. The other thing we're looking to do is build the plants where they're needed and in the geographies they're needed. So one of the downsides today of this kind of ad hoc network of CMOs is it doesn't really fit the way CPG source ingredients. If I am want a protein for a novel granola bar or something, I'm just picking something generic, and I want to sell it in North America, South America, Europe, and Asia, I'm not looking to make that product in one geography and ship it around the world. I'm generally looking for a manufacturing partner that can make that component in different parts of the world, deal with one vendor with multiple manufacturing sites. Generally, that doesn't exist today because most of these contract manufacturing sites are more legacy facilities that came out of another purpose than owned by a lot of the big um, fermentation and food manufacturing facility. So it's, you know, it's really about bringing the scale, the geography and the cost structure we believe doesn't exist today in the contract fermentation market. Fantastic, thank you, Mark. Excited to learn more about liberation. Um, let's move on to Alex Batista at Geltor. Uh, Alex, can you give us, what's Geltor up to? Can you give us a broader picture of, of uh, what Geltor is focusing on? All right, so Gelto is about six, five, six years old, and we do design the proteins, starting with uh, collagen, several types of collagen um, that we've taken to scale and are in the market. 
uh, initially for the beauty and personal care sp uh, space. Uh, you know, we got several products in Southeast Asia, the, uh, the US. And then uh, last year, we had a very successful run with uh, Lonza, now called Arxada, uh, where we produced um, uh, uh, over to, well over 10 tons of, uh, of the forever food uh, uh, collagen for food and uh, nutrition. Uh, the beauty of it is, is one of, one of the reasons I joined, to be very honest, is that it's a, you know, one platform, multiple proteins. So we have one process and can produce many, uh, many different proteins that way, uh, which, uh, which makes it a lot more attractive if, um, or when you start putting steel in the ground. Sure. And so as the CEO, uh, what, are, what are the problems you were hired to solve at Geltor? Um, <laughs> So uh, one of the problems I'm trying, I've been, I've been asked to solve is take this to scale, right? Make this a robust, uh, I like to call it idiot-proof process. And um, very excited that we, uh, that we did that. We, we got a solid proof point. Uh, the next problem I'm trying to solve is how do we balance the, uh, the commercial hockey stick with, um, with uh, you know, uh, expensive VC or uh, debt dollars? and building your own facility because to mark mark's point you know many of the cmos today are um, obviously not a perfect fit to uh, to the protein processes so you know costs are a little higher and so you're going to partner up or you're going to build it yourself um and and when when do you pull the trigger um so you know that's a tight partnership with the commercial team got it and so more broadly and with mark and Doug's comments in mind. Uh, how do you view the biggest challenges in in the in the field or the industry overall? I think I think the uh, this is this this is a challenge. Like I just said, not not unique to to the bioprocess industry. I think it's it's always a a question of um, of commercial uh, uh, pull versus technology push. And so, how do we? Um, you know, we don't have a lot of successes in this space. Let's be honest here. And so, how do we um, how do we scale this uh, this uh, wisely? Um, meet meet customer demand. Um, don't make too much. Don't big build too big. Uh, build smaller multi geographies. Uh, but again, that's not just for biotech. That's for any any product you basically bring to market. I think that's a big big challenge. Sure. Right now. And you've mentioned that CMOs are getting a little bit more picky about what projects they take on. Um, what what proof points do you think need to need to be proven out before going to a CMO or um, or uh, someone to help help scale? Yeah. So so uh, a couple observations. Uh, you know, um, tying into Mark's uh, apocalypse uh, um, um, story a while back. What some of the observations I have is that. Um, that the large fermentation companies are starting to catch up and see an opportunity and are opening up capacity for, uh, for, uh, for our peers, for folks like us. Um, the, other, the other observation I have is that the CMOs are getting a little more picky as to who to take, they take on to, uh, to uh, take to scale. Uh, in other words, you know, not everyone is ready to, uh, to go and are sent back to the drawing board um, before, uh, before, uh, before to go to scale. The other, the other thing is I, I, I see startups um, in this economic environment starting to back out of large commitments. Uh, you know, you talk, it's a lot of money, right? We're running several months at a CMO. So I see, um, I see uh, some slots opening up as folks try to uh, spend their money more wisely. And investors probably want to see POs before, um, before we go big. So, those are a couple observations. Now, to the one observation that they're getting a little more picky, I would say you know you got to you got to lock in your process early, right? Uh, I'm I'm an R and D guy myself, a turn manufacturing, but I'm always eager to take the latest and the greatest strain to scale. But that is uh, that is a that is a bad recipe for success. At some point, you got to lock in the process, lock in the organism. And I know you're going to have a much better organism next week, probably, and a much better the week after. But you lock in the process, and then you got to demonstrate that you can run this at you know several thousand liters, maybe up to ten thousand liters, three independent times, and you get you get the exact same result um, uh, within you know five ten percent. 
error. To me, that is always the, the first qualification to, uh, to, uh, to talk to a CMO, right? So you lock in the process, you demonstrate it multiple times, you write it up in a so-called tech transfer package, and that's the data you take to a CMO. Say, hey, here's proof point. Um, are you ready to, uh, to take me on? Got it. Great, thank you. And you know, you have a first first row seat at Geltor as you're commercializing these these uh, proteins. How do you how do you bridge the gap between um, some of what Doug was talking about in terms of the regulatory hurdles and perhaps consumer perception to uh, to the, the 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 science aspect, the biotech of what you're doing? It seems like th that's um, that's a bridge that uh, needs to be needs to be gapped. Um, I'm just wondering how you kind of think end to end in terms of kind of soup to nuts science to consumers willingness to, to purchase. So, so I think, I think we came from a, a time, um, I'm not kind of dating myself here, but we came from a time where I had a hammer and I was looking for nails and, you know, I come out of grad school. I have this, uh, this hammer and I'm looking for nails and to Doug's point earlier, um, I think regarding, we, we start with the end in mind here. So what, what problem are we trying to solve for first? Uh, at, at Gino, we always looked at the best alternative process. So, <laughs> you know, you've got a great idea, you've got a great product, but what are you trying to solve for? And what is the best alternative cost? And, and do you still have a business case? Um, and, and so it's not just about uh, cheaper, it's also about regulatory, it's a story, uh, it's the, it's the, uh, the claim substantiation, um, because in the end, in the end, they all need to... Um, to be true to go to market, right? So do you have FTO? There's always four criteria that need to be true. Do you have FTO? Do you have regulatory approval? Can you scale it? And is somebody gonna buy it, right? For any product, any product. Um, and so I always refer to those four points uh, when you're ready or not. Got it, great, thank you, Alex. Um, looks like we have some questions coming in uh larry taylor asks uh the globally distri distribu distributed processing model is compelling can the process be engineered to, to uses uh to use various feedstocks that are available in each respective geography such as cane vegas palm vegas etc yeah i'll jump in first so <clears throat> i think even when i look at geographies you know before we talk the alternate feedstocks, we have to talk the traditional ones. So if I'm looking at building in the US versus Brazil, and I've done both, US is corn dextrose, Brazil is sucrose. Those are not the same. Organisms don't eat those. Some organisms eat them the same, not everybody. As I like to tell people, I'll, I'll ask startups, oh, does your organism run on sucrose? And I'm always told, oh, sure it does. But what I'm asking is, does it run in the same efficiency as dextrose and not always. So I think with any of these, the answer you can often get there, but to get to Alex's question is, have you proved it yet? If I go and my organism, this is not uncommon, my organism is 75% or 85% as efficient on sucrose as say dextrose. Well, that's two problems. First, that's yield loss of sugar I'm paying for. And the second thing is, now I may have other sugar products in there I have to refine. So I do think it's possible when I hear bagasse though, bagasse is in the alternate feedstock category. So that's, I assume the question of converting that into a sugar. And there's, there's certainly technologies like Doug talked about out there, but I also don't wanna lose the focus on even the primary feedstocks are not as ubiquitous as I think people often believe. I think it's a good response. I don't have anything to add. Okay. Um, well, would love each of you to kind of paint the picture of, of what you think uh, the space looks like in in five years. Um, perhaps, Doug, we can we can start with you. Like, what what major uh, developments, technological or otherwise, do you think we'll be dealing with or or uh, enjoying in the next five years, if you can? No, good. And that this is, again, you know, the, the other two guys on the call are where the rubber meets the road. I have the pleasure and the advantage of I can sort of think, you know, futuristic as a, as a more of a venture investor than, than, a, than a manufacturer. 
So first of all, I think that, you know, identifying what the products you want to make, I think that computational methods and tools will become better and better for, for modeling materials, for modeling proteins, with things like AlphaFold, with other techniques, that's gonna to continue to advance. I think that opens up opportunities, even in complex, more complex fields like, um, like uh, microbial polysaccharides and things. So we're gonna have better tools to identify product opportunities. Um, I believe that in the next five years, we're gonna have very robust whole cell models that can help guide us in our process design. Um, these are, you know, sort of modeling cells the way that we currently model chemical plants, where we know gory details about how they work. The trends are there. In five years, these will be pretty good. Um, what will that lead to? You know, just here's one kind of crazy prediction. You know, every protein is basically a different chemical. I see the day where we have custom designed organisms for every single protein that we wanna make, right? We pick, we optimize the organism along with the protein. Uh, just a couple other uh, future thoughts here. Um, there's gonna be um, more and more hybrid processes. These have been around forever, but I think that they will continue to we'll see combined chemical biological processes. We'll use you know, more hybrids of microbial fermentation with enzymatic processes or with chemical processes. So people will think out of the box. I, I once made up the term syncretic chemistry playing on the word you know, of the merger of religions. I think we gotta merge these different types of chemical processes into a, into a broader way of thinking about the world. And um, I think new, you know, new manufacturing approaches. I think what Mark is doing with his new company is really exciting. That's gonna be, you know, big, big future impact in the field. And I think these new feedstocks will start to become more and more significant. Fantastic. Looks like we have had some other questions come in from the audience. I do wanna get, get to those. Um, an anonymous attendee asks, uh, upcycled waste from ag or otherwise seems to be a trend that some startups are using as feedstock. Is that more of a nice story amid the already constrained production process rather than practical? I, I, have, an, I have an answer to that. A good example is a company called Full Cycle that uses uh, uh, wastes to uh, turn into um, into uh, fatty acids that then turn into uh, PHAs, polyhydroxy I um, I, th I think it comes down to the economics again. Um, two things, economics, but also as BSF used to call it, you got to feed the beast every day. So if there's, a, if there's a holiday weekend and there's no waste, what are you going to run? Uh, right, you got you to feed that, uh, that plant 24-7. So I don't think it's uh, it's uh, it's hoax. I don't think it's fake. I think there's there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, at the same time, your feedstock is free, so that's a big savings. As sucrose or glucose is usually the main main cost driver, so that's yeah, a big. It's advantage. never it's never free. As soon as you well, want it, there's a price. <laughs> that's right. You still got to haul it, right? But well, um, and, and as soon as there's a demand for it, you know it's yeah. no longer free. Right. But anyway, it's not. It's different from uh, from uh, from your glucose supply. So you got to feed the beast, and uh, they got a lot of work to do on the optimization, getting the cogs down. That's my few cents. And, and I agree. And it's I actually misread that question when you said nice. I thought it said niche, and I actually agreed with that. And this is, I think, full cycle is a good example. I think it makes sense for certain size. As, as Alex said, as you get bigger, and I agree completely, I've run facilities that were based on other people's um, byproducts. You can only make one primary product. So if I'm trying to make a primary product and I'm taking someone's byproduct, I don't get to turn around and say, oh, wait, I'd like it with a little more of this or a little less of this in, in my feedstock. You're getting what you get. So it's certainly admirable and makes a ton of sense when it works but I don't think it's gonna be the primary source of most of these technologies. Fantastic. 
Trent Colbert asks, how much more does the cost of producing per liter go up as you go down in scale? For instance, how much more expensive is it to produce your first 10 liter batch versus producing your first 100,000 liter batch? So since this is kind of the Liberation Labs business model, I'll jump in. So it's, I mean, it's economies of scale are, are real. I've, I built fermenters up to 625,000 liters. It doesn't take you that much more labor and other things to run it. So when you look at, if you go to a CMO and look at the cost of, uh, you know, 500 liter run versus a hundred thousand liter run, it's 20 times bigger in size. I'd have to do the math in my head. It may only be four or five times more on a per run cost. So economies of scale are real. I would tell you having lived through the, the biofuels days and having some, some, you know, PS, PTSD related to it, it's a big facility is economically much better as long as you can sell the product. But if you build a big facility and aren't running at capacity, so that was, I think, a comment Alex made earlier. So the economies are real as long as it's supported by being able to run at that capacity. Terrific. Uh, an attendee SBB asks, outside the US and Brazil, what are the common feedstocks used in other geographies, for example, Asia? Um, I mean, uh, everybody probably has knows a little bit about this. Um, you know, India has a, has a lot of uh, sugar cane and so sucrose. You often hear about cassava, you know, starch being important in parts of Southeast Asia. I believe um, Nature Works has announced they're building a lactic acid plant in Thailand, and I think they're going with glucose, with dextrose. So most of them are varieties of sugar that either come from sugar cane or various starch um, plants like, like corn or like cassava. Tapioca, yeah. Tapioca, yep. And I, I think as we, to kind of go back to your question on the future, and I start this by, I'm working with, or I'm on this with two former cargo guys who know way more about sugar than I do, but we basically as an industry taken the legacy sugar that was there for other purposes. And the question is, if I look at say the corn eth or the um, ethanol industry, they didn't in the end source traditional sugar, they co-produce their own purpose-built sugar from starch for their needs. The question is, will, will the sources of sugar morph more towards large scale fermentation? You know, this is really more of a question that can the traditional sources be made cheaper if more focused for the needs of industrial fermentation than what is out there today, even from the traditional feedstocks? And that's one, I know there's a lot of people talking about doing it, I myself, I think the jury's still out on whether it gets there. Great. Well, any final thoughts that uh, any of you three would like to, to leave us with uh, today before we part ways? Um, I have a, I have a couple on the uh, where this is going. You know, in uh, in sure, over the next few years. So I, I agree with Doug on the design aspect. You know, to target specific functionalities. I think Delta is an example where we, you know, looking at animal free it has nothing to do with vegetarian or vegan. It has everything to do with, you know, we've gone to the moon, we're going to Mars, we're driving electric cars, but we're still killing animals for proteins. And that's typically a blend of types of proteins. So if we have the design of a function building, we can be, uh, can be a lot more specific. And then the other aspect from a processing perspective, uh, I think we're getting a lot better scaling down. So we, we are very good in uh, small scale fermentation where we learn what we're going to see at scale or mimic what we're going to uh, see or the impact for scale. I think the next step is to do the same at DSP. You know, DSP is off the downstream is often uh, so oh, we've got to go to the pilot plant or beyond. I think there's an opportunity to, um, to do some scale, st scale down uh, as well in the small scale in the lab, saving a lot of money, smaller, better, faster, cheaper. And then the LCA, you know, water typically, as, as Mark mentioned earlier, water typically is ugly. 
compared to many alternative processes. So I think the LCA is still an opportunity from that perspective. You know, I, I would probably say there's two things I think we need to work through over the next, you know, five to 10 years. One is this manufacturing versus scale up. We use the term CMO. I would argue 99% of what's being done today is scale up, not manufacturing. Manufacturing is a multi-year long-term thing to sell a product to make positive cash flow. Most of what we're still focused on is, you know, smaller scale. So we need to get to the larger scale to get the economics. And I think Alex brought it up earlier, you know, we need to figure out how to fund all this because we're doing most of it with equity now. And to build out what we need, we have to get both the technology development and the corresponding offtakes to a point, we can get much more of a debt component into this because to build out what we need to build out, we may need to prove it on equity, but it's gonna have to be built out with a bigger debt component than we're getting today. Great, appreciate that Mark and Alex. And I, I appreciate all three of you taking the time uh, this morning and, and uh, this evening for you, Alex. Um, thank you all to the attendees for, for joining us. Uh, as a reminder, this uh, will be available for replay. I believe it will be posted on YouTube. Um, and with that, I, I hope you have a, a great day. And please let us know. Please reach out if you have any follow-up questions or want to learn more about iSelect. And we will keep you posted on the next Deep Dive webinar series, which will be in the next couple months. Um, and look forward to hopefully seeing you there. Thanks again and have a great day.